We are in our out class outline for essentials class. We have been covering, um, see if I can remember the, the full outline. We, we cover the doctrine of the Word of God in a couple of weeks. Then we co talk, cover the doctrine of God in a couple of weeks. Then we go over the doctrine of creation, man, Jesus Christ. We cover his person and his work. Then we look at salvation in three separate weeks. And we also cover the doctrine of the church in um, and so in this cycle, we're back at the doctrine of the word, the introductory part. Last week, we spoke about the authority of the word of God and the canonicity of the, of the Bible. So today, we're going to focus on the essentials of characteristics of the word of God, that it has clarity, that it's uh, the necessity of it, and the sufficiency of it. Okay? So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll cover the clarity. Um, Brian, do you, no, you don't have an outline yet. Dr. Carl, would you read us the definition about the clarity of Scripture from Grudem's Systematic Theology? Okay, so the Bible, the old, the old terminology for clarity of the scripture is a perspicuity of scripture. But since most people don't know what perspicuity means, it's not very clear anymore. So in order to be clear about the, the doctrine of the clarity of scripture, we will use the Bible's clear. The Bible is clear, and the definition talks about how it's, it's written in such a way that we can understand it. We can understand it. It's not for the church hierarchy. It's not for, for a seminary student. It's not just for, um, for a particular group of people who have received a particular revelation, but it's for everybody to be able to read it. And everybody can understand it. Isn't that a blessing? That God communicates into us in a, in a way that we can understand? Think about how smart God is. And then about, you know, how, how much we know. Have you ever met anybody who loves to communicate and show off their vocabulary just by the way they, they talk? Or somebody who writes a book that's so complicated that their audience can't understand it? And then they, they somehow, they can, they can think, well, I, this just shows off my intelligence by not being able to communicate. No, the most the intelligent being that can be conceived is the one who communicates with clarity, simplicity, so that a child can hear the story and read the story and understand. That is a great blessing that the Bible has for us. Okay, so let's think about the objection then to the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture. What is the opposite? What is the opposite, and what is, and how does it come up? How does it, what does it look like? Um, for example, somebody could say, when you read them in scripture, well, that's just your interpretation. You've heard that before. <laughs> okay, think about how that is contradicting this doctrine of the clarity of the scripture. How, well, how does it do that? Talk with me. Think th let's think this through. How does it when somebody who says, well, that's just your interpretation. Sergio? Mm -hmm. So the actual meaning of it, the meaning of the Bible, is up to personal flavor. You know, Neapolitan Bible. You like strawberry, somebody else like vanilla, somebody else likes chocolate. You know, it's a, strawberry is as good as chocolate. It's all in the same container. You can, if that's what you, how you want to interpret. You know, I remember I was preaching at Crane's Juice before, and I was quoting a scripture. 
I can't remember what scripture I was quoting. I'm, I'm quoting the scripture, and then the lady goes by, there, that's your interpretation, you know? And, and all I was doing was quoting the scripture. <laughs> that, the point is, that, that is the attack on the clarity of the scripture. To say that somehow, it's all up to interpretation. What do you, what do you say when, um, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, so, it, so Jesse is giving us the solution. You know, this is the, the concluding application for the clarity of the scripture that um, Jesse jumped ahead to. It, 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 but I, I'll, no, no, I'll, I'll emphasize it now and then we'll, we'll touch it again at the end. Is that the, the solution for the clarity of the scripture when it's objected is to say, okay, well then what, what does it say? What does it say to um, force them to see that apply the, the doctrine of the clarity of the scripture to say, okay, then if you don't think it's my interpretation, what does it say? And the scripture is so clear that uh, they are forced to understand what God's communicating. And when you make them say, okay, what does it say? Uh, sometimes they'll try and change it, but this, the scripture is clear and you can point out the details of the text. Okay, so if somebody um, begins to say about, okay, this is, it's only your interpretation. Um, it's that attack on the doctrine of the clarity of the scripture. Let's go ahead and we'll look at some of these um, texts. And when we look at these texts, um, I'm going to look for the answer to be written down. Um, the answer I'm writing for is how does that show the clarity of the scripture? Okay? So how do these particular scriptures show the clarity or support the, the doctrine of it? Um, let's take Mr. Feliciano. Would you read Matthew 12, 3? If you're following along on the internet at home in the cry room, then um, we're going to have class participation. So when I read this scripture, you need to read it at home or you need to read it like in the cry room in order to follow along because people will be speaking here without a mic. Okay, so Matthew 12, 3, we'll see, maybe 3 to 7. Okay, brother. So in here, Jesus is speaking. How does this verse show that the scripture is clear? Keith? Okay, so he just asked him, have you read it? Have you not read? Now, he, well, the point he's driving home is uh, that this is so clear, you should know this. You should know this by now because the Bible's clear. It's not the Bible's fault that you're thinking this way. It's whose fault? Yeah. So it, you see how Jesus knows that the Bible is clear. 
Jesus knows the Bible is clear. And we have more examples of that in, in Matthew 15, 19, 22. So you can write down there that um, Jesus holds people responsible to obey. That shows that it's clear. Okay, let's go with Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Ben, would you read that one? Noel, would you take the Psalms? Those two verses from the Psalms. And then Robinson, would you take Deuteronomy 6? Let's begin to look at some of these. Okay, so first, Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, so in this text, how does it support that the, the scripture is clear? That's right. So it, it's, it's for all the saints. It's not for just a hierarchy. It's not for the elite. It's not for um, the highly educated. For anybody in church. The same is with 1 Corinthians 1-2. Okay, so this supports the clarity of the scripture because the scripture is for everyone. Okay, Psalm 19 and, and Psalm 119. Let's turn there. Okay, so Psalm 119, 7, about the law of the Lord is perfect, for the soul, and the testimony, making wise and simple, okay, and then Psalm 119. The entrance of your word gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. Okay, so what's the, the same theme in there? Okay, so... Um, what's the application then for the clarity of Scripture? Tom? Yes. The, 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 word of the, God, the Word of God brings light, not darkness. Rightly understood. Um, and the beauty of the Word of God is that it, it takes someone who's simple and then makes them wise. It doesn't say that the simple would be us be confused by the word of God, but instead, the, the word of God is a light to you. Okay, so the word of God is, we're held responsible. It shows that the message is clear. You can't be held responsible for something that's not clear. Um, the, the word of God is for all the saints. The word of God is specifically for the simple. The word of God is for, in Deuteronomy 6, Robinson? Okay, so who is who get, receives the word of God here? In Deuteronomy 6. So children? Okay, so let's think about the, the clarity of the message, right? You're in, L, you're in kindergarten class. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And little kid, little Johnny raises his hand. That's just your interpretation of the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> because of the simplicity and the clarity, the word of God is clear the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things that's true that's right um, now let's um, let's think now the, the remaining two verses are more towards okay um, the complexity of the Bible now it's true that the main things of the Bible are clear but there are some things that are very hard to understand what are some of the hard things to understand? Brian saying in eschatology, it can be complicated. What else, Sergio? 
the Trinity. Trinity is greater than we can understand. What else? Covenants. Yeah, co understanding how all the covenants work together can be complicated. Okay, something else? Yeah, how does the sovereignty of God and responsibility of man work out? That could blow your mind, right? Okay, so then what are the, some of the si simple things? The gospel. Yeah. It's a blessing a child can understand it and be saved. What else? The response, turning from sin is not complicated. Faith in Christ is not complicated. We make it complicated. Dorian? Yeah, sin, being sinful, right down to the, our very core. Richie? What's, I'm sorry? Yeah, that God made the world in six days, and seventh day he rested. Okay, now let's think about some of those simple things. They should be simple. Some people make them very complex. Six days, seven, maybe it's a literary device that actually is representative of something that is millions and billions of years. It seems pretty clear when you read it. You know, if you read it in, in our class, right, in the kindergarten through fifth grade class, they won't have any problem understanding that God made the world in six days, but somehow we do. So what are some of the things, now what we're getting into now with the clarity of scripture is why is the Bible not clear in some, in some things when it should be? Like, I would say it, it, um, it's our sin. Our sin clouds your understanding of the Bible. The more sin you have, the harder it is to understand the Bible. The, we are born in sin. It's not just something that uh, we do. It's something we are. So because of that, we've never known a time when there are some th things in the Bible that are, hard to under that are easy to understand. It's always been complicated. And that comes from ignorance. We just don't know. We should have known some things, but we haven't because of our sin. It's like um, if you sin and you don't come to church and you don't hear the sermon on the background of the book of James and then later on when we would need to know the background of the book of James and you haven't come, that ignorance has led it so that you un understand the Bible less and it makes it harder to follow the Lord. Right? So we all struggle with varying degrees of ignorance. We all struggle with varying degrees of sin. And those things make it so the Bible's harder to understand. Let's look at some of that with... John seven seventeen. Linda, would you read John seven seventeen? Okay, so what's the knowing here in this verse contingent upon? Yeah, a willing heart. A willing heart. Jesus, is, isn't that encouraging? You know, when you, when you talk to somebody who has that, um, that refusal to understand or apply the word of God, that like for it, often with an atheist, an atheist will put up those intellectual arguments, right? Well, I never, I haven't seen enough evidence, so because of it, it's all an intellectual thing to me. I haven't seen enough evidence, and what the Bible is very clear about is that that's not a intellectual problem; it's a moral problem. So God's saying about the clarity of the Scripture, clarity of His teaching, that we struggle with it not because it's a, an an intellectual issue, but because it's a primarily a moral issue. And the, there are things, like right now, there are, there are passages of the Scripture that if you were suddenly thrown that passage of Scripture in that verse, and you were told, you know, in front of the class, tell us what it means, stand up, tell us what it means. You'd be like, um, I don't know. 
I'm not quite sure. Is this a millennial kingdom? Is this the, the, the eternal state? Is this a prophecy that's fulfilled with Babylon or Assyria? Is this talking about the virgin birth? Or is this talking about um, when people return from the Babylonian captivity? Is this symbolic or is this? And then you struggle with it, right? There are, uh, but then if you're handed other verses, you're like, right off the bat. God made it in six days, the world in six days. Okay, what the point is, is, um, but if I come to you 10 years from now, 10 years from now, and then I hand you that verse that you struggled with, you could be like, this is what it is. Immediately. God is going to help grow you, Christian, and he helps sanctify you, and in that sanctification process, you get to understand more of the word of God. Uh-huh. Sanctification is a beautiful thing. You know, you, when you're like a kid and you're like, um, you measure yourself against the, the door frame and you kind of like make a little mark. Oh, you're growing, you're growing, you're growing, growing. And then but you, when you look in the mirror, it doesn't seem like you're growing. But then to the parents, look, you're growing like a weed. The, the sanctification works in a similar way. You, you look at it and you stretch and you think, oh, I want to be more holy now. And I wish I could watch it grow visibly in the mirror. But it happens slowly but surely for the Christian. So I'm trying to encourage you to say that um, your understanding of the clarity of the Scripture will grow. You will grow. In the, I've known Josh for a decade. And um, I can say I've seen his understanding of the Word of God um, grow and grow and grow and grow. And so that it's e- maybe it's easier for me to see and maybe even for Josh. Then the blessing of the, that God has with that when sanctification. Okay, so another solution is we also need teachers. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, and that right there, you can just write that down. God gives us teachers. Um, so it's one of the ways we can go about understanding the Bible better. We do need teachers. Okay, what if I said objection to the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture? I said, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. The scripture, the Bible, you can just make it say whatever you want it to say. That's an attack on the clarity of the scripture. What's the answer to that? Keith? Okay, context. Okay, so if you, um, Keith is bringing out an interpretive principle. Context. So, in inter- interpreting the Bible rightly will be the answer to those who twist the Bible. The Bible doesn't say whatever you want it to say. Understood rightly. You can twist it, but that's not the message of the, message of the Bible anymore. The Bible interpreted rightly will say what God wants it to say, not what you want it to say. Okay, so you, you see... Um, when someone is um, attacking the clarity of the scripture, you understand that it's for children. Jesus says, he applies it, um, you're responsible to understand it and obey it. It's for the simple. It is for all the saints. It's because of our own sin, we don't understand it well. And God has given us um, teachers that help us with that understanding. He's given you people who are farther along in growth that can help you grow and help you understand the Bible better. That um, All of these things help answer the objection that, well, that's um, just your interpretation. The Bible's not clear. Who can know? But back to Jesse's point, the most helpful thing to do when somebody questions that, like you read a scripture, and they say, well, that's just your interpretation, is to turn it back and have them apply the doctrine and say, Okay, then what does it say? And if you know that scripture, then you can direct them away from a false interpretation and true by just pointing out the text. That's really the key is that you're applying all these facets to them. You're, you're applying that it's for them. You're applying that it's they're responsible to read it and obey. You're applying it by making them um, give the correct interpretation. Okay, Josh? Mm 
That's right. So, so showing the inconsistency in worldview and interpretation, that they don't do the same with a magazine, with a paper, with a book, as the way they interpret the Bible. We don't want our own uh, messages to be twisted and changed. So authorial intent. Okay, so when we look at um, why do we misunderstand the Bible, it's because of the, the hardness of our own hearts, our own pride, our own greed, our own lack of faith, our own failure to pray and study. Very often we don't understand the Bible because we're not dependent upon God as we read it. Very often we're, we fail just to read it. And that's why we don't know it. We read it and we don't, have the, we don't believe it. We lack faith in what God has written. Um, sometimes time will make the difference in understanding the scripture. Um, sometimes we need to learn more about the science and art of interpretation. Sometimes we need to not make affirmations where the Bible's silent. In other words, we want the Bible to speak in a way that um, God hasn't spoken. Um, okay, so the, since the scripture is clear, let's think about the next point, about the necessity of it. The necessity of the scripture. And Jerome, would you read the, the definition about the necessity of the scripture? Okay, so the Bible is needed for salvation and for sanctification. The Bible is needed for you to know God and it's needed to know him in a growing way. You need to know him for salvation and for sanctification. The Bible is absolutely necessary. Okay, so if I have um, the objection that... There, if I say this, there is a wideness to God's mercy. God wouldn't condemn people to hell just for having, not having heard about him. How do you respond? Tom? Okay, so you go to hell for sin. For sin. Um, and I would take that and say, well... I never, um, I'm the good native in, a, in Africa. <laughs> maybe, maybe I shouldn't use, shouldn't use Africa with Tom. I'm the good native in Indonesia, <laughs> some place where he hasn't been. <laughs> so everybody likes to point out the good natives in Africa, I think. <laughs> so um, I haven't heard about that I'm a sinner. And I haven't heard that um, about Christ. Why should I be de condemned to go to hell for just not hearing? Okay. <laughs> Can you summarize that? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you could read the scriptures 118 and verse 32 that are on the outline. Just for brevity's sake, if you could read verses 18 to 20 and then verse 32.
Romans 1, 18 to 20, and then also verse 32. Okay, so the scripture here is saying there's a condemnation, there's a wrath, and it comes on, um, comes on who? The unrighteous? I'm sorry, Alexander, I couldn't hear you. Yes, all ungodliness? Okay, so did somebody have to read the Bible to um, receive this wrath? No. Well, and why? Okay, so Richie's bringing out verse 32, that conscience, they know the righteous judgment of God, knowing that they, some, those who practice such things are deserving of death, okay, and yet they still do the same, but then they approve those who practice them. Okay, so... It's our, uh, in our conscience, we're, we're born with these laws written on our hearts. So because of that, we're responsible. What, how else, um, why else does the judgment come? Dorian? So Dorian has read Luke twelve forty seven to 48, and, and it shows how about whether if you re reject and disobey against more light, you get greater judgment than those who, who rebel against less, against no light, but they're still, the rebellion is punished either way. Okay, so the, what's revealed of God to everyone who's ever been is that he's made the world and that you're responsible to respond to that revelation that he's made the world. The things that he has made means you are responsible. You know that. And what's written on your conscience. So you don't need the Bible to be judged by God. He's already revealed himself in creation. So what do we need the Bible about? So in our objection about, well, there's a wideness to God's mercy. You don't have to hear about God to be, hear about Christ to be saved. Um, creation is enough to condemn does the Bible say you have to hear about Christ in order to be saved? Okay, prove that, Shadrach. Okay, let's go to Romans 10. Go ahead, read verses 13 to 17, for context's sake.
how do these verses show that you have to hear about um, from the Bible? Yep, this is in the Bible. The only place you're going to hear the words of, of Christ. Okay, so the, with the series of rhetorical questions, let's, let's answer them. Um, how shall they call on him who they not believed? Question mark. What's the answer? Okay, you can't call on him if you haven't believed. Okay, then what's the respo- what's a qu- answer to that how they believe in whom they not heard? Okay, you can't. You can't believe. Okay, how will they hear without a preacher? You can't. You can't hear unless there's a preacher. Of what? No puedes. No. Yeah, no es posible. <laughs> then, um, and how will they preach unless they're sent? Um, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Okay, so... Um, give me another scripture. Is that First Peter, First Peter one twenty two. So how does this passage show that you must hear the necessity of the Bible in order to be saved? So... That's a very good passage, brother. Thank you. You want, you want to write that down next to Romans 10 and John 3 on your outline there. John 3.16 certainly shows for all um, shows that you must hear about Christ in order to be safe. Brian? Okay. Ephesians 1.13. So how does that verse show that you the necessity of the Bible to be saved? So you must hear the word, Tom. Acts 4, verses 10 to 12. So how does this verse show the necessity of the Word of God? Mm-hmm. That's right. It's only under His name we can be saved. One more than Andy. Mark chapter 8. 34 to 38.
Same question, Andy. How does this verse show the the necessity of the Word of God? So the only place to hear of Him, the only place to hear of His words, are, is in the Bible. Yes, there's not like a mysterious value that somehow if you read these words in this order, then it's like a magic uh, formula. You know, Hocus Cadabra, Pocus, 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 Pocus Walla Walla Washington, you know, bam, then conversion happens. You know, it's the truths, the meaning of the scripture that is communicated that brings conversion. So, yes, it's a good point that... Um, that's Romans 10's point as well, that it's a preacher. That it's somebody who's a, a um, somebody in a, who evangelizes, somebody who talks about, not preacher, not, not preacher like preacher here, right? That in the context in Romans 10 is not this kind of preacher. It's somebody who's having a conversation with somebody, speaking to them about the Bible. So, yeah, it's somebody sent. It's not they didn't come into an assembly. It works this way too, but it's primarily the um, the application is for for all of us as we go and speak to somebody. Okay, so the in your outline of necessity, Romans ten, John three shows that it's absolutely necessary for salvation. Um, you must have the truths of the Bible. You must have the Bible communicated to you. It's nece- it's necessary for eternal life. We covered Romans 1, which talks about how it's, n- it's not necessary for condemnation. The Bible's not necessary to be condemned. It, for 1 Peter 2 and Deuteronomy 32, let me ask you, how would you respond if somebody said to you, you asked somebody, how are you doing spiritually? He said, well, I haven't been reading my Bible, but I'm doing good spiritually. How would you respond to that? Is that possible? Is that true? I haven't been reading my Bible, but I'm doing good spiritually. Ben? Can you say that a little louder? So Ben has quoted the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, 4, that man shall not live by bread alone. Somebody, somebody had a hand. Yeah, so who? Amen. So Bridges brought out John 15, 1 to 8, about the necessity to abide in him. That's a, um, the abiding in him is a trust and reliance upon him. And you can't do that in your, in your own. You have to do that through the word of God. Brian? Yes, 
So thank you, brother. That's a good, that's a good scripture. The necessity of the spiritual battle having the word of God. Okay, if you consider the you know the armor, right? Um, if you say I'm not going to have the um, take a piece of the armor out, I'm going to go into war without the helmet of salvation. Is your head important in a, in a battle? Okay, what about your torso? If you take off righteousness, if you take off the belt, you know everything is falling down, right? <laughs> What if you take off the, the feet? If you lose your feet, are you going to be good in a battle? Okay, what if you go without a shield? <laughs> what if you go without a, a weapon, without your sword, into the spiritual battle? Clyde? So the, the question is about, um, in before we had copies of the scripture, how does that operate with the necessity of the word of God? And the answer is Psalm 1. The answer is, is Deuteronomy 6, that they're going to be, um, that what happens is the necessity of the oral um, message. In other words, um, it's heard at the times of, certain times of reading, um, and then those are repeated um, by the fathers, by the mothers, by meditating on the Word of God. So in other words, you would, you would take the family together and you'd say, let's go over the, pro the story of Jonah. Tonight we're going to talk about Jonah and the story and what happens. So you're rehearsing the Word of God with your children, and it has to be a lot more memory work. Um, part of our society is... Um, you know, in, in difficulty in understanding these things is the lack of memory work where we have to do now because, well, if I want to know, I'll Google it. I don't have to remember anything. Who remembers a phone number? What's your spouse's number? If I went around and I asked some husbands, what's your wife's phone number? Then there might be a little squirming. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> You just remember the name, right? <laughs> the name with the hearts around it. You know, click, 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 and click it on your phone, <laughs> and it and it calls up. Okay, so the the point is, but if you went 50 years from now, 50 I'm sorry, it's 50 years in the past, and you asked, what was your what was your family's num phone number? You would remember. Why necessity? Necessity has laid it upon you. Okay, so in in a society when you don't have a Bible. Necessity lays upon you for the memorization of the Word of God, and the um, there is much more care in that, um, and there's much there's much greater proficiency in that. In our, in our day and age, and you know, um, in the millennial generation, 2015, it may be hard to understand how we could do that. But believe me, if we didn't have any more phones, we didn't have any more Bibles, um, you would listen to Pastor Rick's sermon so much more intently because you um and you be tr because you're going to have to repeat some of these things you'd be using memory hooks whenever you wait and you would really grow in memorization and repetition of the word of god by meditating on it day and night psalm 1 okay somebody else had in, their hand up shadrach Yes, so um, Shadrach's bringing out the illiteracy rate and, um, in the past or in the different countries, and that's still true today. There are many places where illiteracy rate, like in um, Guatemala, the literacy rate is really pretty bad. It's like um, close to 50%, the numbers I was looking at. Um, that, that's more in the countryside than in the city, but it's still kind of very commonplace. And th so the, the point is, and then that's why I said about oral tradition. 
that oral tradition that you would be, and that's why it's Psalm 1 is meditating on it. it and literally, their phrase is talking to yourself. You're repeating the words that you hear. So if you're illiterate, your, li your listening skills become much greater. Okay? Okay, so to close for, um, the class, um, it's necessary for your spiritual well-being. That's what 1 Peter 2, Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 says, Mo Moses says, it's your life. He says at the end of the um, sermon, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, he says, these words are your life. You've got to hold on to them like it, it is your life. First, um, First Timothy 2, 1 First Thessalonians 4 are verses that show that it's necessary to know God's will. If you want to know what God wants you to do, know God's will, you've got to know the Bible. And the sufficiency of the word of God is, is covered in 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17, about how God has given you all things that are needed for your spiritual growth and well-being. The scripture contains all the words God intended for his people. Listen, listen now this, to this quote as if you were illiterate, okay? <laughs> the scripture contains all the words intended for his people at each stage of redemptive history and everything we need for salvation, for trusting him, and for obeying him. The scripture contains all these things that we need. You, um, if here with the sufficiency of the scripture, you're tempted to go somewhere when you have a problem besides the Bible. When you have a problem, you're tempted to go to a friend, you're tempted to go to a family member, you're tempted to go for advice instead of seeking it in the word of God and seeking first the understanding in the word of God and then going to other counselors. The Bible is sufficient. It's sufficient now, and it's been sufficient in every age. God has just the amount of revelation that he's wanted his people to know. And God has said it, and we find the answers. So we need to discover the way God wants us to think in the Bible. We need to add nothing to the Bible. And there is nothing that we can add to the Bible for our salvation or sanctification. The Bible is sufficient. The legalist will be tempted to say that what the Bible says is not enough in order for us to live rightly. Let me add this extra. That's n that is an attack on the sufficiency of the Bible. Um, our, everything we have is derived from the Bible, and the Bible is sufficient. It's enough. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. It is our life. It is our life. Help us to meditate on it day and night. Help us to seek your will in it. Help us to trust it, that it's sufficient. Help us, we thank you and give you praise for its clarity. And we, we also give you thanks for its sufficiency, that you've given us a book that is possible to read, all of it, and it's, it's all that we need to live for you, to know you, to serve you, to grow. Thank you so much for your perfect, precious word. Lord, we would rather have it than the winning lottery ticket. We would take a Bible over a thousand years of life. We love your law. How we love your law, Lord. Thank you for it. Amen.